watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Davenport Auto Park, the ride of your life. And also sponsored by Flora's Glass, serving the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. Good evening, friends, and welcome to another episode of Way Back Wednesday. I'm Randy Adcox. Um, got a lot of ground to cover tonight, and tonight's show is kind of, um, a few weeks ago I had a caller call in and ask about when the Nash Edgecombe County County line was moved from essentially the Rocky Mountain Mills, Tall River being the boundary, moved over to the train tracks that now separate Nash and Edgecombe counties and Middle Rocky Mountain. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Did a little bit of research. I wanted to share some information with you. Um, you know, long before there was a Nash County, there was Edgecombe County, and of course, before there was Edgecombe County, there was what was referred to uh, as un, uh, unsettled, unexplored territory in North Carolina, and that was pretty much anything west of a line that runs roughly um, northwest to southwest, northeast to southwest. Um, that probably another 50 or 60 miles east of Rocky Mouth. You can imagine an imaginary line that runs roughly northeast to southwest, um, kind of parallel to I-95 actually. From that point east was really all there was in North Carolina. Everything else was pretty much unexplored territory. So I found some maps I'm going to share with you. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the political hoopla surrounding the moving of the county line. Um, you know, over the years there's been a lot of distortion of the facts, a lot of political bias, frankly, has been in, in, injected, if you will, into the conversation when it comes to why the county line was moved. Um, I've heard over the years and read a lot of things that, frankly, have some element of truth to them, but they tend to stretch the truth to, to fit a particular argument or a political uh, discussion. So we're going to try to clarify some of that tonight, too, and talk a little bit about some of the things that led up to the county line being moved from Tar River to the Edgecombe, I mean, to the uh, Rocky Mount Railroad tracks in the center of town. So anyway, um, today is February the 15th, by the way. I uh, hope you got a chance to get out today and enjoy some of this glorious weather. It was beautiful out there. Uh, I was in and out, had several things going on today, but I was in and out of it all day long. It was really nice um, to be out in some warm weather this time of the year, particularly. Okay, I'll tell you what, Lee, let's start off. Go ahead, if you would, put up item number one. I found this map um, that actually shows North Carolina, and the map is dated from 1633 to 1729. And I gathered from that that this wasn't very much that changed in, in the way Rocky Mount, I'm sorry, the way North Carolina was laid out um, in that time frame from 1633 to uh, 1729. But as you can see there, um, that gray area to the left um, is basically unexplored and unsettled. It's kind of uh, basically wilderness, if you will. And you see really the only parts of uh, North Carolina at that time that were identified are in the eastern part of the state. Um, and a little bit north and east of Rocky Mount area in this part, but you say, as I said, there's a little bit of a uh, northeast-southwest boundary there that runs kind of parallel to present-day 95, and from those points eastward was really all there was to North Carolina. And this was this predates the formation of Edgecombe County, certainly the formation of Nash County and Wilson County, and most of the counties that we expect to see on a map like this now. But this was the way it was in, in the early, uh, late 1600s, early 1700s. And I found an article that kind of speaks to this in a little more detail. I won't read the whole thing, it's kind of long, but uh, so I'll kind of give you an idea. It says on May 16, 1732, Royal Governor George Barrington, with the consent of his council, granted the petition of the growing population within a large area south of the Roanoke River to an upper branch of the Northeast Cape Fear River for a new governmental precinct with representation in the Colonial Assembly. The governor dec uh, decreed this to be the new Edgecombe Precinct, named after Richard Edgecombe, Lord of the English Treasury. Although this type of action had been taken in the past by royal governors, the Colonial Assembly refused to accept the new governmental unit, primarily due to the large size of the precinct and the potential for its representation to shift the political balance of the colony. 
After several years of political debate and defeated legislative acts, an agreement was finally reached and a new precinct was officially created by the Colonial Assembly in 1741. The year in which the actual co uh, county of Edgecombe was created is not clear, as the current boundaries within Edgecombe Precinct began to shift almost immediately after it was created, as smaller, more easily governed areas started to petition and were approved as separate counties, such as Granville County in 1746, Halifax County in 1758, Franklin County in 1776, and Nash County in 1777. So, Nash County, according to this, was formed, of course, in 1777, and it was cut out, if you will, of a piece of Edgecombe County. And so, that wasn't the first time Edgecombe County would be chopped up and divided up and otherwise uh, altered, if you will. It happened several more times over the years. And, obviously, when it came time to uh, discuss and debate moving to Rocky Mount, um, uh, county line or Nash County, Edgecombe County line as it relates to Rocky Mount anyway in this immediate area around Rocky Mount. As you might imagine, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of hoopla, a lot of uh, dissent, frankly. Um, Edgecombe County by and large was opposed to moving to county line for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, Rocky Mount Mills uh, was a large employer. Uh, a lot of people who lived at that time, of course, in Edgecombe County worked at the mill. Um, but, you know, there was, there was some reasons that um, the powers that be wanted to move the, the county line. And one of the biggest was uh, kind of evolved over an argument over the bridge over Tar River there at Rocky Mount Mills. And there was, uh, you know, a lot of discussion about whose responsibility it was to take care of the upkeep and maintenance of that bridge. And so, as discussion began to mount about the possibility of moving the county line, the bridge became a, a central focus of the discussion. Um, the bridge over Tar River, there at Rocky Mount Mills, and, and who should be responsible for the maintenance and upkeep and repairs on that bridge um, as it needed to be done. And so, um, and you know, this started talking away started about uh, the late 1860s um, about moving the county line and as temperaments got heated up and people got discussing it more um, people began placing uh, editorials in, in the local newspapers and certainly the um, the Tarboro newspaper, the Tarboro Southerner, uh, became uh, a focal point of the discussion at least from the Edgecombe County side uh, there were several editorials and opinion pieces that were published in the Tarboro Southerner, and one appeared in December of 1870. Uh, Lee, if you would, put up item number two, and this is just a, um, I will read this, it's not very long, it's kind of a short little segment, but it says, let it not be done. We notice that a resolution has already been introduced into the Senate to extend the county line of Nash to the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad. A committee have made a, fa a report favorable to the move and now it awaits the action of the House. Uh, if it is passed, four rising towns on the line of the railroad will be split in two and an immense amount of taxable property taken from Edgecombe. We do not conceive this to be a political project in any respect and we call upon the representatives from this county to the legislature to look into the matter and see that Edgecombe is not thus despoiled of her territory without reason or cause. The citizens of the county should send up immediately petitions against this unwarranted spoilation which is intended for the benefit of a few to the detriment of hundreds. We are satisfied that four out of every five of the people in the district concerned are opposed to the move, and it seems strange that any action has been sought in the legislation without being backed by respectable petitions. So a couple of points here. Number one, this, whoever wrote this, and they were not identified in the article, but whoever wrote this editorial, I, I'm sure was correct that the majority of the people in Edgecombe County were opposed to it. But not everyone was. There were some people in Edgecombe County who were actually in favor of moving the county line for various reasons. Um, but another point about this was that um, there was a big discussion in, in lots of circles about how this should happen, if indeed it should happen. 
And the most common argument that arose was, let the people vote. Let us have a referendum. Let us put our voice into it and let us decide if we want our county to be split up in a big chunk of it, uh, given essentially to another county. And so, as it turns out, that never happened, uh, probably because uh, there was enough votes, they, they were afraid, I'm sure, that there were enough votes to cancel it uh, or prevent it from happening if they were indeed to allow a referendum to take place. Item number three, if you would, Lee, um, this is, um, and it's three pieces here, so I'm just going to read you this real quickly. This is a rebuttal, if you will, that also appeared in the Tarboro Southerner um, in January of 1871. And it's a rebuttal to someone who had wrote, written another piece criticizing the move uh, and saying basically that uh, the argument about the bridge and the expense of the bridge at, over Tar River at the Mills, you know, was basically fabricated and, and not, not factual. So this thing starts off as, my communication on the subject of the new county line, which appeared in your valuable paper, has elicited a, a, a reply signed by, in parentheses, Edgecombe, I'm sorry, in quotation marks, Edgecombe, which demands some notice at my hands. He seems to take exception at my calling the present county line an imaginary one and harps upon the word imaginary to quarry his point. But I am sure he has drawn heavily on his imagination to sustain himself, which will be proven by the following facts. And using the word imagination, I merely meant that the present line was not a notable one as the railroad will make it. In the first place, in reply to the argument that the bridge at the Falls of Tar River was a heavy expense to Nash and great profit to Edgecombe, your correspondent says the bridge has been kept up by W.S. Battle and that when he appealed to the citizens of Nash and Edgecombe to assist him, he received the penance of $10 only. Item number four, Lee, if you would, and this continues on with the discussion, he says, this is a mistake as the following cert uh, certificate will prove. Nashville, January the 10th, 1871, as November uh, 10, uh, 1867 of Nash County Court, an order was made to W.S. Battle for $1,000 for building the bridge across the Falls of Tar River. On the 19th of October, 1868, uh, the order was approved and has been paid and is now on file in my office. The uh, minutes docket show that an order was issued May 14, 1860 for $1,250 for building the same bridge, and on the 14th of August, 1866, an order was issued for $100 for repairs, and this was signed W.T. Griffin, who was the Register of Deeds of Nash County. So the author of this rebuttal is saying, look, there are records on file with the Nash County Register of Deeds Office that shows the county was putting money into the upkeep of that bridge. And item number five, Lee, is kind of the tail end of this discussion here. And, and this same author who wrote the first two pieces says, these are the figures from the record, and instead of $10, Nash County has since 1860 paid out, her, out of her treasury $2,350 to keep up this bridge to build up an enriching town in another county which draws the greater part of its patronage from Nash and yet is not willing that Nash shall have this simple act of justice. It is true Mr. W.S. Battle contributed some, liberally I am, I am informed, to aid in building this bridge. And why, he, why did he do it? Because as a generous and liberal-minded citizen of Edgecombe, he saw, as the old line stands, it was wrong and hard for Nash to build the bridge, and he came to her assistance. Uh, this of itself is argument enough for the legislature to make the railroad the line. Uh, informed that, uh, I'm informed that Mr. Battle is neutral on the subject, will not take part either way. By the way, Mr. Battle, this W.S. Battle, was the president of Rocky Mount Mills at that time. I uh, says, um, he's neutral on the subject, you know, he doesn't care one way or the other. So the bottom line was Nash County had spent over $2,000 in the last five years on the upkeep of this bridge, uh, you know, building it, maintaining it, upkeep and so forth. And so there was a, you know, a consensus among a growing number of people that, hey, Nash County is, is paying for this bridge, but yet Edgecombe County is getting to use it too. And the citizens of Edgecombe not, don't have any skin in the game. They don't have any expense in the maintenance, upkeep. And so, you know, fair is fair. Let's, um, if Edgecombe County doesn't want to help us pay for the bridge and pay for the upkeep, then let's move the county line to the railroad tracks. 
So that's kind of how it all came to be. Um, item number six, Lee, and this is um, this is too small to see on your screen. I do apologize, and I'm not going to try to read this whole thing. But I just kind of want to give you a quick um, other side of the coin, if you will, because in 18 in September of 1872. Obviously, the county line had been moved. It was moved in 18, early January 1871. The county line was moved. So by September 1872, it's been almost a year uh, and a half now, going on two years, since the line was moved. And so this editorial appeared also in the Tarboro Southerner. And it starts off this way. The Falls Tar River Bridge. It will be remembered that during uh, controversy about the county line, one of the main arguments advanced by its advocates was the injustice done to Nash in requiring her to assist in keeping up the bridge at the falls of the benefit of Edgecombe. It, is, uh, it was stated that if the line was changed and tax on the property between the falls and the depot was given to Nash, she would build a bridge in every, uh, in every way strong and secure. Uh, as the Rocky Mount Mail says, and that was a newspaper that was printed in the, in the late 1800s, as the Rocky Mount Mail says, this plaintive wail at last grew into a shriek that was heard by the legislature. Nine-tenths of the property holders, including the proprietors of the various mills at the falls, living between the Weldon and, and um, the Wilmington Railroad and the Nash Line, apprehended, I'm sorry, appended their signatures to an earnest petition to extend the line to the railroad. This was conditional. It was agreed and understood that Nash was to erect a structure commensurate with such a great thoroughfare so soon as she realized the taxes and added to her coffers uh, in the way of revenue it would happen. Okay, so what's going on here is that uh, almost two years after the county line was moved, there was no new bridge. And that was a big impetus in the folks that were in favor of this move to agree to go forward with it because it was said if Nash County moves the line to railroad tracks then the increased revenue that Nash County would get from the people who were paying taxes in that part uh, the new part of Nash County if you will would be enough money to help Nash County pay uh, to build the bridge to maintain the bridge upkeep the bridge and so by uh, September of 1872 when there was no new bridge and nothing had changed essentially at the bridge there was an outcry of those that said, okay, y'all said you wanted to move the county line so we could help pay for the bridge. Where's our new bridge? Okay. So, Lee, I'll tell you what. I just realized it's time for our first commercial break. Bring it back to me. We're going to take a quick break, folks. And when we come back, I'm going to show you some interesting maps. Uh, I found a series of maps from 18, I'm sorry, from 1776 up through 1871, 72, excuse me. And it shows how... Edgecombe County, Nash County, Wilton County all came out of Edgecombe County and how much of a difference there was in the way Edgecombe County ended up. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Way Back Wednesday. I'm Daniel Moss, owner of Cornerstone Funeral Home, and I'd like to invite you and your family to give our family an opportunity to serve you in your time of need. And we offer a full line of funeral services, everything from visitations to graveside services to cremations on site with a live crematory, as well as a banquet hall to meet the catering needs of our families that we serve. We offer catering service, we offer refreshments prior to visitation and services of our family, and we want to invite you to come and experience the difference here at Cornerstone Funeral Home. When faced with special care needs for elderly or disabled loved ones, families want compassionate, comforting care. That's Tender Touch Home Care Services' goal providing the level of care we would expect for our own. With over 10 years of home care excellence, Tender Touch provides an array of services that keeps your loved one at home. From personal care, light housekeeping, errands, and meal preparation, to our private duty care program, which combines all of our home care offerings in one package. Tender Touch Home Care Services, where your needs are our concern. We're in our 18th year of practice at the Hammer Chiropractic Center, and we've seen over 15,000 different people in the Rocky Mount area. 40% of headaches actually come from a neck problem. Many patients come in taking multiple aspirin, over-the-counter medications and such a day, and we can get you to stop doing that and actually fix the problem so the headaches don't arise anymore. A lot of people think chiropractic hurts, 
It does not. Most of the people come in and they feel great when they leave. And we're back, we're back. Folks, if you just tuned in, we're talking about the move of the uh, county line, the Nash Edgecombe County line from Tar River, essentially Rocky Mountain Mills area, over to the railroad tracks, which at that time was referred to as the Wilson Weldon uh, Railroad Track. And there's a couple of points that I think it's important to remember about that move. Number one, Edgecombe County did not make that move. Nash County did not make that move. The North Carolina legislature made a decision to move the county line. So it, it's really not fair to blame Nash County or to say that Nash County took something away from Edgecombe County. Uh, the North Carolina legislature weighed all the facts out. It was a legislature that made a decision to move the county line. Now it could be argued that um, some people in Nash County had some pull, if you will, pulled some strings maybe even, and had some friends in high places that got this to happen. I, I won't dispute that argument. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. We don't know. But in any case, it was the North Carolina legislature that made a decision to move the county line. Um, another point that often gets left out of this discussion is, you know, by, by 1871, we're only five or six years out of uh, the Civil War by now. And the South, in general, uh, was devastated by the war. Um, uh, crops were, you know, ruined in many cases. There was no industry to, to speak of. Um, you know, regardless of how the war started out, very early in the Civil War, the decision was made um, to basically take the fight away from the Confederacy. And that meant, in, in many ways, destroying uh, the fabric of life in the South. Um, that meant tearing up things that could, you know, generate income. Uh, mills, for example, Rocky Mountain Mills, prime example, was burned by the Confederate by the uh, Union troops, um, and that same thing took place all over the South. Um, it was just, uh, you know, an attempt, a, a really organized effort to take take the fight away from the Confederate troops, um, break the back, break the will, if you if you will, uh, of the people of the South to, to continue to fight. And so the economy was in shambles throughout the South, and North Carolina was no exception. Uh, North Carolina had you know, paid a heavy price. Uh, we contributed more troops to the Civil War, to the Confederate effort. Uh, we certainly lost more, uh, had more casualties uh, than any other state in the Confederacy. And North Carolina suffered along with the rest of the Southern states uh, in, the, in the aftermath of the Civil War. And so, you know, uh, most states in the South were poor, North Carolina was no exception to that, and certainly most counties in North Carolina were, were poor, and so, you know, I guess it was a, a pretty good argument from the standpoint of the legislation in Raleigh, said, okay, look, Nash County is poor, Edgecombe County is poor, let's try to even up, you know, uh, the expense so that there's not a burden on one county or the other regarding this bridge. Now, whether or not that was a legitimate argument, will be debated for years to come, I'm sure. But uh, that was, in fact, a, a big part of the decision-making process to move the county line from Tar River to the railroad tracks. Okay, I mentioned before the break I found some maps, and these are interesting maps because they show from 1776 up through 1871 how these individual counties that, that were part, originally anyway, of Edgecombe County came into existence. And it's really interesting when you get from 1870 to 1871, the time that the county line moved, you got to look really hard to see on a map of North Carolina any difference between Nash and Edgecombe counties between 1870 and 1871. That being said, let's like put up item number seven. This is a map of 1776. Now, 1776, there was no Nash County. There was no Wilson County. Uh, you see on your screen there, in this part of the state, you had Edgecombe County, Halifax County, uh, Wake County to the west, um, but there was no Nash County yet, no Wilson County, and this is the way the, obviously the, the uh, western part of North Carolina had started to get developed to some degree. You see some other counties there. Um, but in 1776, Edgecombe County was still, uh, I mean, was there, and there was still no Nash or Wilson County. So uh, next item, Lee, item number eight. Uh, this map is from the very next year, 1777. And by 1777 now, you see that Edgecombe County has been basically cut in half and Nash County uh, now exists uh, to the west of Edgecombe County. 
Um, I'm always able to find Nash and Edgecombe County on the map of North Carolina because I look for an open book. That, that's what I always do. And sometimes you can get confused a little bit, but that, if you kind of keep that in mind, Nash County is on the left-hand side of the book, Edge on the right-hand side of the book, but there's your open book there in Nash and Edgecombe County. And this is the way the state map looked, and you can tell in just a couple short years, uh, the western part of the state was still growing, but in the, the eastern part especially, more cows are coming into an existence, and, and the eastern part of North Carolina was indeed growing at a much faster rate than the western part, obviously. Okay, Lee, item number nine, if you would. This map is from 1855. Fast forward to 1855, and you can see now the entire state of North Carolina is now made up of counties. And, um, you know, you can see the, the part of the western state that was previously very sparsely populated uh, has now got counties up and down all over. And, of course, you see now also that you've got Wilson County. So we took the bottom part of the book and cut a little section out of it there and put Wilson County in. So in 1855, Wilson County came into existence. And you now you see Nash, Edgecombe, Wilson County all out of the original piece of land that used to be Edgecombe County. Okay, Lee, item number 10, if you would. Fast forward a few years to 1870, and by 1870, not much has changed as far as the way Nash and Edgecombe and Wilson counties appear on the map. From 1855 to 1870, uh, other counties were you know, branching off or splitting off or adjusting borders and so forth. But Nash, Edgecombe, and Wilson counties pretty much maintain uh, their, uh, from, from seven, 1855 to 1870, there's no change in those three counties. Okay, now, item number 11, Lee, and keep your eye right here for just a minute, folks. This is 1870. In 1871, the county line moved. All right, there's 1871, and I challenge you to leave flip-flop back and forth, if you would, a few times between 1870 and 1871. That's item number there you go. You got to look hard to see any change in that map between Nash and Edgecombe counties. It did. It changed in 1871, but it's hard to look at a map of Nash and Edgecombe counties and see. And that just kind of gives you an idea that, you know, as much hoopla as was made about that move, we're talking about a tiny, tiny fraction of, uh, you know, property especially in the grand scheme of things, when you look at the state of North Carolina as a whole, and indeed the eastern part of North Carolina, the, the area that was taken away from Edgecombe County and given to Nash County, uh, I don't recall seeing a, a land mass as far as how many acres and so forth it was, but you can tell by the map from 1870 to 1871, it did not change the, the state map very much as it relates to where that county line is. But indeed, in 1871, the line changed. Okay. That's enough on the county line for tonight. I wanted to, um, I will share one more thing before we get off this topic though. Um, Rocky Mountain Mills has got a really neat um, website. We've talked about it before on the show. And I, I went there tonight just to kind of see what they had to say about um, the historical aspects surrounding uh, the county line and so forth. And I found this really nice article that it's kind of lengthy. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I wanted to kind of bring a few things out that I picked up in this article. Um, and it's talking about, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion over the years that there was some racial motivation with the moving of the county line. In other words, it, it's been said by many people um, that race played a big part in, in moving the county line uh, as a means to uh, weakened economically, Edgecombe County, which was predominantly African American. Um, I'm not going to dispute that. There was probably some truth in that. Uh, I don't know that it was a big part of the conversation or a big part of the reasoning behind the move, but suffice it to say it was a consideration, I'm sure. Um, but you know, there was, um, depending on, on which part uh, of history you read and whose uh, interpretation of history you read, you can get some fairly radical um, opinions about the moving of the county line and about you know why it was moving and so forth and so when I read this article from the Rocky Mountain Mills um, it kind of helped put things in perspective for me uh, it at least gave me another perspective anyway and I'm going to read a little bit of this here it says uh, starts off it says uh, it was talking about the, the Civil War and Reconstruction and, and what had happened in this area and how economically depressed the area was 
and it talks about some of the um, African-American leaders uh, from Edgecombe County. Um, and it said African-Americans in the region's white population suffered from the economic downturn after the war. Crops had gone to feed Union and Confederate armies. Much of the state's industry had been destroyed. Money and credit were scarce. The state's economy, notes historian William Link, lay in ruins. With the value of property in the state having been reduced by half, economics would most directly impact the change in the Edgecombe Nash County line, but the racial politics of the region and state served as powerful undercurrent. Um, it goes on to say the first attempt to change the political boundaries surrounding the Rocky Mount occurred in the spring of 1869 and was most assuredly a result of the economic disparities in the region. Though Raleigh's Daily Standard newspaper reporting on January 1st, 1869, that there would soon be an attempt in the General Assembly to make the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad the line between Nash and Edgecombe County. The legislation took a different uh, track. On, on Tuesday, March 2nd, 1869, John B. Respice of Beaufort, representing the 3rd Senatorial District, introduced a petition by area residents and a bill in the state Senate to lay off and establish a new county line by the name, I'm sorry, establish a new county by the name of Rocky Mount. The proposal was not for a new county line, but for an entirely new county. So in 1869, there was a pro, uh, provision put forth or a bill introduced to the North Carolina General Assembly to create a new county called Rocky Mount, the county of Rocky Mount. Obviously it never happened, um, but that was, I guess, a compromise offer that was put forth. And last, it goes on to say, according to even the most critical newspaper reports, the movement for a new county line had significant local support. Legislation moving the county line, however, originated in the North Carolina Senate and succeeded despite opposition in the General Assembly and among local residents. The architecture of the bill to change the county line was Lawrence Battle, a conservative Democrat from Nash County and a relative of the Battle family that owned Rocky Mount Mills. No sources exist explaining why Battle supported the bill, but based on newspaper accounts, the new county line was intended to reward those people of Nash County who had, fought, who had bought stock in the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad and whose county had previously been unable to benefit from the economic gains of, gains of the railroad's presence. Yet the new county line would also bring the entire Tar River Bridge under the control of Nash County. This was a significant issue for supporters of the bill who thought Edgecombe residents were benefiting from the bridge without paying their fair share. W.S. Battle, for example, the owner of Rocky Mount Mills, had contributed his personal funds to rebuild the bridge after its collapse in 1867. So again, there was, there was some economics involved that I just don't think get enough uh, coverage when we talk about the reasoning behind the move of the county line in 1871. Um, whether or not there was some bias in the uh, General Assembly and, and the state uh, government that uh, orchestrated this move, we'll just have to you know, guess on that. Uh, but the bottom line is that it was not, as I've heard some people say, that you know, Nash County took land away from Edgecombe County. No, Nash County didn't take anything from Edgecombe County. The state legislature did this. So if there's anybody to blame, you can blame the state leaders at that time. Okay, let's go ahead and move forward then. Uh, you know, in 1867, Rocky Mount became a city. That's when Rocky Mount was incorporated. And so, you know, this was all obviously uh, at a point in time you know, coinciding with this move to move the county line and so forth. And so a lot happened between 1867 and 1967 when Rocky Mount had our 100-year centennial celebration. But I stumbled across a newspaper uh, from 1967 in Rocky Mount Telegram that had literally about a 100-page spread covering the centennial. And there's some really neat old pictures, and this is one right here. Um, this is the Bank of Rocky Mount under construction in 1918. It is recognized as the building which now houses offices and most recently contained People's Bank and Trust. So this was the People's Bank and Trust building in later years, but it started out, of course, being the Bank of Rocky Mount in 1918. And so um, there was a lot of really neat photographs in this spread, and we'll go through some of them here as we go on through the night. But in fact, Lee, let's go ahead, item number 13, and, and I apologize, some of these are kind of grainy and not very good quality. 
but says um, a high, the caption reads, a high dive act is being performed in this 1902 photo of the first Masonic temple building. It was built in 1899 and burned in 1904, succeeded by another temple. It is the site of today's city hall. Now, of course, this appeared in 1967, so the uh, city hall it's talking about is also long gone now. Um, a lot of you may not realize there was, there's actually been three Masonic temples in Rocky Mount. Uh, the first one in 1902, um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, 1899, um, and then there was another one built when this one burned, and then, of course, the one that we know on Franklin Street now, uh, I'm sorry, Church Street, um, but um, there was, the second one was, again, it was the home of the Rocky Mountain Municipal Building for, for many years. Okay, Lee, item number 14. Um, this picture was just one of, and everything we're looking at from here going forward appeared in this 1967 spread in the Rocky Mount Telegram. This here, it says, shown here with his commander, the finest airplanes in 1938 is J.D. Winston, the first Rocky Mount pilot who still uh, flies. Uh, Winston was an, uh, was an incorporator of Eagle Airplane Company at Rocky Mount, which operated Eagle Airport the forerunner of the present municipal airport. This is talking about, of course, the airport over on North Church Street there. Um, and of course, J.D. Winston, uh, many associated with uh, auto equip downtown Rocky Mount on, on Washington Street down there. Um, but he was an avid aviator and uh, owned more than one airplane, as I understand. Okay, Lee, item number 15 um, is a picture that first appeared in 1903 and of course it reappeared in this 1967 edition of the Rocky Mount uh, newspaper, Rocky Mount Telegram's coverage of the centennial celebration. Uh, and it says, uh, this old Negro driving the Bullock's cart was a well-known figure in 1903 when this photo was taken. His name was recorded as Barry or Bynum Joyner. He is on Main Street, named Railroad Street in those days. So in 1903, this gentleman, we're not sure if his name was Barry or, or uh, Bynum, uh, but his last name apparently was Joyner, and uh, he drove this old uh, cart here, um, like it was driven by, by an ox there, um, up and down Main Street. Okay, Lee, item number, i tell you what, bring it back to me. I just realized it's time for our next commercial break. Uh, I've got quite a few more of these to share with you folks, and so we'll take this next commercial break. When we come back, we'll jump right back into these. By the way, welcome your calls at any time during the show tonight. 407-1111 uh, is the number. Take a break, get these words from our sponsors, and we'll be right back with more Way Back Wednesday. Don't go anywhere. Daniel Moss, owner of Cornerstone Funeral Home, and I'd like to invite you and your family to give our family an opportunity to serve you in your time of need. And we offer a full line of funeral services, everything from visitations to graveside services to cremations on site with a live crematory, as well as a banquet hall to meet the catering needs of our families that we serve. We offer catering service, we offer refreshments prior to visitation and services of our family, and we want to invite you to come and experience the difference here at Cornerstone Funeral Home. When faced with special care needs for elderly or disabled loved ones, families want compassionate, comforting care. That's Tender Touch Home Care Services' goal, providing the level of care we would expect for our own. With over 10 years of home care excellence, Tender Touch provides an array of services that keeps your loved one at home. From personal care, light housekeeping, errands, and meal preparation, to our private duty care program, which combines all of our home care offerings in one package. Tender Touch Home Care Services, where your needs are our concern. And we're back, we're back. Um, folks, we're talking about uh, the Rocky Mount Centennial Celebration. It took place in 1967. Uh, that was the 100 year anniversary of Rocky Mount being incorporated into a city. And I stumbled across this uh, spread in the Rocky Mount Telegram from 1967. It had, golly, close to 100 pages. And amongst those 100 pages were lots of neat articles and stories um, and a lot of neat old pictures. And so I saved some of these pictures 
And again, they're really old pictures and they've been reproduced from uh, online from the original in the newspaper. So I apologize, the, qual the clarity and quality is not that I would, not what I would like to be able to present to you. Um, but it's some neat old history here in these old pictures, so I thought I would share them with you tonight. That being said, item number 16, Lee, um, this is a building many of you remember, recognize, it's still standing, uh, barely, I should say. I rode by a couple days ago and it was about to fall in, the roof is gone. Um, but it's, uh, in my childhood, it was Pearson Machine Works. That's what I remember. But of course, it was also Rocky Mount's first city power plant. And um, this old building is still there. I think it's frankly too far gone to be saved now, which is a shame. Uh, the history that's in this building and uh, you know, like so many old buildings in downtown Rocky Mountain and all over uh, the center part of the city uh, that date back to the turn of the century, it's just a shame that uh, there was not more effort made years ago to save these buildings. Um, we talked about the old Rocky Mount hosiery plant last week's show that's literally right down the street from this. Um, this, of course, faces Andrew Street and the, um, the old Rocky Mount hosiery is there on the, at the railroad tracks at the corner of Franklin Street and Andrew Street. So these buildings are literally a stone throw apart from each other and they're both falling in on each, you know, on themselves, which is a crime shame, but you know, uh, I guess there's just no interest in saving them when, it, when they could have been saved and now I'm afraid it's too, it's too far gone. Item number 17, Lee, and I didn't realize I was going to have two pictures of the same man tonight on the show, but um, as it turns out, I printed this picture before I realized that this is another image with J.D. Winston in it. This is from uh, 1935, and it says J.D. Winston in the center there holds trophies, or hands trophies, I'm sorry, hands trophies to H. Revis Nelson, a Rocky Mount resident today, uh, but then manager of the Charlotte Airport, and Johnny Crowell, another North Carolina, uh, Carolina pilot, when they tie for first place in an air show at the dedication of the Rocky Mount Airport on June 25, 1935. Winston was the first Rocky Mount pilot and was president of the Carolina Aero Club. So um, quite a difference between this picture and the other picture with J.D. Winston outside of his airplane there. But um, you know, I remember Mr. Winston uh, when I was in high school, I worked, uh, you heard me say before, at Davidson Company Auto Parts. And of course, uh, we all the auto parts stores in town knew the employees of all the other stores, and so um, I had occasion to go in auto equip. And uh, but anyway, the um, you know the history of aviation in Rocky Mount uh, goes back quite a ways, and amateur aviators have, have always uh, since the age of oh, got a call. Let's get this call. Hello, caller, you on the air? All right, you're talking about J.D. Winston and his being involved in local aviation and whatever. J.D. Winston, I have been told, went to a reunion in Manio's 50th anniversary of the Wright Brothers flying the airplane down there at Kitty Hawk. And J.D. Winston flew his plane down there and was on location uh, before Orville Wright died. Wow. Well, that Orville Wright died in 1912. Mm -hmm. His brother, Orville Wright, lived to see a jet plane fly, and there was a 50th anniversary that happened down there at the Outer Banks, and J.D. Winston, I understand, went there. Oh, well, that's cool. That's a neat story. That would have been around 1953, I'm guessing. I think the first flight was in 1903, so... Right. Yeah. That's cool. That's well. You know, he he flew for a long time. He was flying in the early 1930s, and and 20 years later, he was still flying. So, I don't know when he quit, but he did fly for quite a while. Yeah. All right, buddy. Thank you. Okay. All right. So moving on, Lee. Item number 18, if you would. Um, this is the old Rocky Mount School. I mean, I'm sorry, the old Rocky Mount Mill School. And it says it was constructed on Falls Road across from the main mill office to serve the children of the mill workers before the turn of the century. The school had one large central room with several smaller ones branching out. Established in 1820, the school was turned over to Nash County in 1927. Later it burned down and the site was replaced by apartments. A small playground now stands where 19th century school children played. Um, a couple things about this picture. Uh, I, in my mind's eye, and that's gotta, it's gotta be just something I remember that's reminded me of this. 
Uh, I could have sworn I had seen this building. Obviously, I could not have. Um, it, it burned apparently before I was born. But in any case, um, you know, this. A, a lot of people who went uh, lived around the mill and worked at the mill, uh, their kids uh, went to the school here. Um, I'm not certain, but I'm fairly sure that uh, some of my uncles and aunts went to school here. I know my mother did not. She wasn't old enough, but I think her older brother and sister did attend this school. Um, and while we're on the topic of Rocky Mountain Mill, I just want to say, last week, if you remember, we talked a little bit about the Riverside Bulletin, the Mills newspaper that was put out during World War II. Uh, it ran from, oh gee, 1943 to 45, I think it was. Um, anyway, I put out the word that if anyone had a copy, I'd like to get a copy of that. And the very next day, I was at my office, and I got a call from someone who uh, was telling me, in fact, um, Don Bullock called and was telling me about someone who he thought might have some. And so I called John Mevin and talked to John Mevin. But while I was on the phone uh, with one of the two, I forget which one it was, I was on the phone with somebody, and I happened to look at my bookshelf, and lo and behold, I reached over there on my bookshelf, and I grabbed what was, in fact, a copy of... Uh, the uh, published book, uh, if you remember from last week, Sam, there was a published uh, version of all the copies of the Riverside Bulletin. And um, I think there was two or three local people involved. I think Bugs Barringer and um, uh, leader, uh, Lita uh, oh, G. Chesson was involved with, I think. I'm not sure if that might have been one more person. But in any case, um, the one I've got is not one of the original published books, um, but it's like someone had taken one of the original ones and made Xerox copies of all the pages. So it's literally about twice as thick as the one that was published. Um, but anyway, I, I had meant to bring it with me tonight and I forgot it. But So I do have one, even though mine's not one of the original published books. I'd still love to have one of those, by the way. Uh, but I do, and I have enjoyed reading through it. Just a lot of neat stories and, and pictures and so forth. Um, that appeared in that paper from the time it was published uh, during World War II. Okay, Lee, let's move on. We're running out of time here. Item number 19, if you would. Um, this is a picture I'd seen before, and it's from 1907, uh, but it's the Rocky Mount Police Department uh, and the officers uh, as they appeared in 1907. It says, shown left to right are G. G. D. Wheelers, J. Williams, um, looks like C. P. Hedgepath, uh, Henry Hedgepath, Sid Davis, uh, Judge W. L. Thorpe of Recorder's Court, uh, L. Dickens, Zach Parrish, and Lou Sumner. So that was your police department in Rocky Mount in 1907. Um, this building, I'm fairly certain, is long gone now. I think it was on Main Street in the general area there where the old firehouse and a few doors down from the old municipal building was. I believe it's where this building was. Um, long gone now, of course, but uh, neat old picture there from 1907, Rocky Mount Police Department. Okay, Lee, item number 20. Um, since we had one about the police, I think we'd throw one in about the firemen, too. This is, of course, the Rocky Mount Fire Department. Uh, number two station was built in 1924. Uh, this building, of course, still stands. Uh, the two-story house on the corner there on the right is long gone, but this old building is still there. And... Um, I've not been in this building a long, long time. I need to go back by there. I think it's open a day or two a week. I'm not sure what time that is. And by the way, before I forget, uh, I got an email from Joyce Dantzler uh, at the last week's show. Uh, they're starting to uh, open up the uh, Railroad Museum for visiting. Um, and I don't have the dates and times in front of me. I do apologize. Um, but if you're, inter if, if you're interested in going down there and seeing the museum, I'd encourage you to do so. There's a lot of neat stuff in there. And uh, I talked to someone earlier this week who has made some plans, I think, to donate some more stuff to the museum. So uh, they're constantly taking in, whenever someone offers anyway, uh, contributions, uh, old railroad um, paraphernalia and stuff. Uh, but it's a neat little, it's a small place, but it's got a lot of neat history there. So if you get a chance to go out and see it, check it out. I'm going to be glad to see you. Okay, let's go to item number 21 if we could. Um, this was an ad that appeared in the 1967 coverage uh, of the bicent I'm sorry, the Centennial here in Rocky Mount. Uh, and it was neat because, oh, we got a call. Let's get this call. Hello, Carl, you on the air. All right, that museum, I understand, is a sign inside the train station lobby that that place is open on Saturday from 12 noon 
to 3 p.m. Railroad Museum. Okay, great, great. Uh, Thank you. All right, there you go. So 12 to 3 on Saturday. And uh, I think when warmer weather comes around, it may be open a little more often. Uh, but it's a neat little, doesn't take long to go through, but it's a neat little trip. You look at something to do on Saturdays. Okay, this ad appeared in the Telegram, as I say, 1967. And it shows Planters Bank. The top pick, of course, is Planters Bank. That building is still standing, too, by the way, there on Main Street. Uh, in the bottom building, of course, is the quote unquote new Planters Bank. Um, so, and this was just, uh, Planners Bank bought this, about a full page ad. I had to shrink it down to get it on, on a page we could look at. Uh, but um, neat old picture there at the top of the old Planners Bank. That again is still standing. Okay, uh, item number 22 for Kud Lee. Uh, this is a picture from 1916. And I mentioned earlier that there was, has been a total of three Masonic temples. This is the second one. Uh, this picture was taken in 1916, is the second Masonic temple, which replaced the one burned in 1904. It housed the Opry House, now the courtroom of City Hall. So as I said earlier, um, after the Masonic temple moved out of this building, City of Rocky Mount took it over and became a municipal building. And uh, when I was a child, that's where, where City Hall was, uh, before the new City Hall was erected there on the block, uh, surrounded by Church Street, Franklin Street, and Hammond Street, and so forth. Um, but a neat old picture here from 1916, a uh, neat shot of what this area looked like during that time frame. Okay, Lee, item number 23, and this is a really horrible grainy picture here, I do apologize. As I said, this is, some of these are old, old pictures. This is from 1919, and it says this was the south end of Main Street in 1919 when the Ricks Hotel Annex was under construction. So, uh, looking at this picture, I can only assume it's that one there in the middle by the, by the old car with the tree in front of it. Um, but um, anyway, the 1919, uh, it looks like the roads are still dirt there. Um, I'm not certain about that. You see the train track there in the center of the picture is that great level, that street level. Um, but in any case, a neat old picture there of downtown Rocky Mount in 1919. Uh, speaking of early Rocky Mount, item number 24, Lee, this is 1915 Rocky Mount. Um, this was known as the drugstore corner. It is the site of today's Baldwin's department store. Next to it is the early location of the Telegram, uh, Rocky Mount's first daily newspaper. And I don't recall ever seeing this before, but if you look at that white building just to, well, almost in the center of the screen there, it's got the word Telegram. And I did not realize the Rocky Mount Telegram was ever on Main Street, but in 1915, um, it was um, right there beside Baldwin's. Uh, so anyway, 1915, that picture. Okay, um, item number 25, Lee. Um, I put this in here just because I thought it was needed. If anyone would like to have this in a readable format, I'd be glad to get it to you. Um, this is the complete story of the day that the Union troops came to Rocky Mount and wreaked havoc for sure, uh, burned the mills, uh, there was just lots of mischief for lack of a better term. Uh, there was no battle down there, and I, you know, there's been a, uh, a lot of confusion over the years um, with Battle Park. A lot of folks thought, well, there must have been a battle there at some point. No, it was never after the Mr. Battle that started the mill, the old battle. Um, but in any case, the Union troops in 1863 under command of General Potter uh, did come to Rocky Mount and um, Potter himself was not here, one of his uh, under generals, I guess you say lieutenant generals, and I, the name escapes me at the moment, but anyway, they did count, come up to Rocky Mount, they came through Tarboro and came to Rocky Mount, uh, and this is that story, and it tells you all the details of the, what we later refer to as Potter's Raid, um, and you know, there was some some really gut-wrenching stories that were told about uh, atrocities committed on the innocent um, old men and women and children um, as these troops went around just pillaging and plundering. Um, you know, these, these were innocent people that had done nothing wrong, where they were not uh, combatants, they had not taken up arms against anybody. Uh, but they saw, you know, in many cases their homes were burned, their valuables were pillaged. Um, I read, read stories of uh, livestock being thrown into whales, hogs and goats and pigs and animals thrown into whales to contaminate the water, um, crops just destroyed, um, valuables stolen. And so 
you know, it was just a horrible time to be a Southerner uh, and, and have these Union troops come through here. Uh, but in any case, this article appeared in this edition, 1967, in the centennial edition of the Rocky Mount Telegram, and it's a really, really neat article. Uh, and so if anyone would like this in a readable, I can get it to you in a readable version. I just wanted to kind of share it with you that I'd never seen it before. I'd never seen a story put in the paper that told all the details about what happened that day when the Union troops came through Rocky Mount. Uh, real quickly, Lee, let's jump on these, these last couple of pages here. I included these just because it's got some neat Rocky Mountain history highlights. Um, 18, I'm sorry, let's start real quickly. 1670, the Tar River called Torpedo by the Explorer appears on John Letterer's map of Eastern North Carolina. 1713, end of the Tuscarora War results in most of the native inhabitants of the region being driven out. 1733, 20 families recorded as living in the vicinity of the Falls of Tar River. 1744, Baptist congregation formed at the Falls of the Tar River. 1757, the first church built at the Falls of the Tar River. 1760s, the first grist mill and saw mills built at the Falls of the Tar River. 1777, north-south line dividing Nash from Edgecombe County drawn across Tar River at the Falls. Uh, 1781, the Army of Cornwallis passes a few miles west of the falls on its march from Wilmington to Yorktown. And I recently learned that Mr. Cornwallis came right by my house on this march. Um, didn't know that until very recently, uh, but that, that happened. Uh, 1816, the name of Rocky Mount appears in history for the very first time as a post office is established for Rocky Mount, Nash County, North Carolina. 1818, the first mill, uh, second cotton mill in the state was built, the Rocky Mount Mills. Uh, 1825, Lafayette visits Rocky Mount on his triumphant tour of the United States. 1836, P.T. Barnum, later to head the greatest show on earth, visits Rocky Mount. Uh, 1840, the first train of the Wilmington and Raleigh, later the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad passes through Rocky Mount. Uh, 1842, the post office was moved from Nash to Edgecombe County, indicating movement of the village of Rocky Mount from the Falls to the railroad depot. Um, 1860, Rocky Mount and Tar were linked by the railroad. 1861, Rocky Mount contributes a number of men who perform heroically in the first pitched battle of the war between the states at Big Bethel, Virginia. Uh, Robert Henry Ricks among those who were in that battle. Uh, 1863, Union Cavalry raids Rocky Mount and burns railroad depot, mills, and bridges. 1865, Battle and Sons build cotton and grist mills burned by the Union troops. 1867, state legislature incorporates Rocky Mount as a town. 1870, Rocky Mount's population stands at 357. 1871, we talked about this a few minutes ago, Rocky Mount divided Nashville County and the line moved to the railroad. Folks, that's going to do it for us tonight. We've run slam out of time. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate those that called in and shared your memories with us and your information. Have a great week, folks. Take care of yourselves. Be kind to one another, and we'll see you next week and more Way Back Wednesday. Good night.